Lord Jesus, we say it with our simple words once more that you're all we have that counts for anything in eternity. Everything else is for your glory. Everything else is from you. Everything else is through you. And therefore, we say it again, use our lives in any way you choose, especially use our lives now to cause each other to persevere. Make us a means of each other's eternal salvation, I pray. Help us to feel the weight of this and know that you will lift this burden and use us in it. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So the topic assigned to me in this series on perseverance is Christian fellowship as a means of perseverance. So let's begin with the definition of Christian fellowship. In the New Testament, koinonia signifies having a share in something or having a share with someone in something. Or you could use the word participation in something, participation with someone in something. For example, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, it is, is it not a, a fellowship, a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a fellowship or a participation in the body of Christ? In other words, when we drink the cup and eat the bread, we share in the achievements of the slain body and spilled blood of Jesus. We share in it. For example, number two, 2 Corinthians 8, 4, they begged us earnestly for the grace and the sharing or the participation in the ministry to the saints. In other words, they desperately wanted to have a share in giving to the poor. We want a koinonia in that. We want to share in that. We want a fellowship in that. Or third example, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship or the sharing of his sufferings. Paul wanted a share in the sufferings of Christ. So koinonia can be a sharing in the benefits of the death of Jesus. It can be a sharing in the financial Relief of the poor, it can be a sharing in the sufferings of Christ. So when I talk about Christian koinonia, fellowship, sharing, participation, that's unique to Christianity, I mean a sharing in our union with Christ vertically that involves us in a shared life in that union together in him. So he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, you are called into the fellowship of his son, which probably means both each of us fellowship shares in union with the son, and because of that, we share in a horizontal together participation with each other in that union. So fellowship of the Son is probably both every one of us has this enjoyed fellowship this way and that involves us in a fellowship of the Son this way. And we know that's exactly John's meaning in 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. So we tell you what we've seen, we tell you what we've heard so that you may have fellowship with us in that all that we know, all that we've seen about Jesus, we're telling you so that you and we will share in it. That'll be our common bond. And then he continues, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father 
and with his son, Jesus Christ. So when you share with us in the things that we have seen and we have heard, this fellowship is part of that fellowship. And we, in our speaking to you, become the means not just of drawing you into our shared experience of those glorious things, but as you share in them with us, you're sharing with us in the Father and in the Son. So when I talk about Christian fellowship as a means of perseverance, the fellowship I have in mind is this mutual bond. And I think mutual, the word mutual would be the English counterpart if koinonia could be an adjective. The mutual bond that Christians have with Christ, uniting us to him, which involves us, here's the nub of the matter, which involves every person in this room, if you count yourself a Christian, united to Jesus by faith, involves us in a profound I wish I had a better word, deep, eternal relationship of love with each other and every other Christian. Deep, profound, eternal. When I think about you right now, how many of there are? 100 people in this room? Just think of it. Forever, you and me. And all the rest of us here, if we belong to Jesus forever, you better better get over some problems, right, with each other. It's just forever and deep and glorious. There's no other way forward than this mutual bond that we have in Christ. And it expresses itself, therefore, in joyful, affectionate. None of this love is a choice stuff. The Bible abounds with words about relationships among believers that is way beyond, I choose to like you, jerk. It's affection. It's something that's really changed about how we feel about other believers. And if we don't, we get a major problem to deal with. So it, it overflows. This, this bond, this mutual bond that we together have in him binds us together in a profound, eternal relationship of love expressing itself in humble service to each other. And that is the essence of the fellowship that becomes the means of perseverance. That overflow of this deep, eternal bond that we have with each other in Jesus overflows in various ways. This text that I'm going to talk about in a minute is verbal. Verbal ways by which we become the means of each other's perseverance. And those may be expressions of love that are blood earnest in moments of great crisis like Play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. And then they were burned alive. And those words kept him forever. Or, most of us don't live on the brink of that kind of crisis. Just be ready when you do to do that with your mouth. Help the person beside you last. Be ready to do that. Most of the time, Christian fellowship and assisting each other persevere would be more like, uh, you will survive these final exams. You will live to see another day. Or after a ping pong game, when you have beaten your friend for the fifth time in a row, you say, you know, Joe, I think God made you to preach <laughs> and made me to play ping pong. That's a pretty good thing to say to a loser, <laughs> to keep him. It is. So 
whether you're facing martyrdom or whether you're facing final exams or uh, what to say about being a very good ping pong player, there is a profound, eternal relationship of love governed by Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for upbuilding, as fits the occasion, martyrdom or ping pong, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Grace for what? That it may give grace, what comes out of your mouth, give grace. Nothing, let nothing come out of your mouth, but what gives grace for what? And my task is to talk about for perseverance. So far in this series, I haven't heard all the messages, but I know we've established at least this much. Um, perseverance to the end in faith is necessary for final salvation. Mark thirteen thirteen. No, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Second, we have seen that perseverance is guaranteed for all the elect or all those who are born of God. Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. And third, we have learned that perseverance is effected by God through human means. And the one I'm assigned is Christian fellowship, and I'm defining it the way I did in order to apply it. The most important passage on this, we read already. It's the most important passage in the Bible on Christian fellowship as a means of perseverance. I invite you to t turn your Bible, open your Bible and turn to Hebrews 3, 12 to 14. Uh, Tom referred to it in his message on the Word of God. Uh, perhaps others have as well. I'm going to do probably one or two things with it that maybe others haven't done. So let's read Hebrews 3, 12 to 14. Just true confession, I've preached six messages on this in the last 36 years. Because every time it rolls around in the 33 years I was here to preach on small groups and their function, I just could hardly leave this text. I just could hardly leave it. It is scary important beyond words. And I think most pastors don't get how important it is. Would like you future pastors and all of you to get it. I was talking with uh, Matthew down here beforehand. I believe that one of those controversial things about the way I went about ministry I didn't put it on the front burner usually, but I believe that every time I stepped into this pulpit, this, this building was built in 1991, so I was thinking about 20, that was done in 13, so was that 23 years I preached in this room. Um, every time I stood here, I believed that the salvation of every person in the room depended on what I said. I didn't have the category like preach salvation sermons to get people saved and then preach other kinds of sermons to get them better. I just didn't think that way. Every sermon, I'm after your salvation because of this text. So let's read it. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief or an evil, unbelieving heart, literally evil heart of unbelief, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, not just on Sundays in sermons, every day. That's why it's for small groups, not just preachers. Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So notice first that verse 14 is the ground or the reason for these two imperatives. Verse 12, take care. Verse 13, exhort one another. So two commands, imperatives, and a ground. 
Because, why take care? Why exhort one another every day? Because we have come to share in Christ if, if, if indeed we hold our original confidence to the end. It does not say, now the tenses are all important here. Hold me to the fire, Greek students. It does not say, if we hold our confidence firm, we will have a share in Christ. It says, if we hold our confidence firm, we have shared in Christ. Which means perseverance to the end in faith is a necessary confirmation that we've been born again. Necessary confirmation that we've been born again. Making it to the end in faith shows we were real. We had indeed come to share in Christ. Now that's the ground of these two imperatives, verse 12 and 13. Take care, verse 12. Exhort one another every day, verse 13. Why should we do that? Why why should you take care about these people sitting next to you? Why should you take care about exhorting every day your roommate and the people in your classroom? Why? Why? Because now you know that if they don't hold fast to their confidence to the end, they perish. That's why. Does that up the ante of fellowship? It ups the ante of preaching. It ups the ante of everything, every conversation, every friendship, every team. It's just huge. Life is really big, really serious if you believe this. So I exhort you to meditate on it a long time. So from the logic of verses 13 in particular, because it's the one that says, use your mouth, exhort one another every day because only if they persevere to the end have they been a member of Christ. That's the ground. So the motive must be, oh, my exhorting is a means to that end. It's really, really, really important. I got to be about this. This is my calling. The inference from that logical connection between verses 13 and 14 is confirmed now in the way the dynamics of falling away are described. Now, just a little word here about homiletics. Um, I love arcing. I've done it all my life. I mean, since I was 22. Um, and I, I owe it more than words can say. And, and, I, and we just did it, right? We just did it. I haven't drawn out all the connections, but at least the, the one that makes all the difference for me is the logical connection between verse 14 as a ground and the imperative of verse 13. So that's arcing. Now, I'm going to shift to what I call the reality factor. Now, I just wrote a book on preaching. It's going to be about 320 pages. I finished it two weeks ago. And um, there's a big, big section on this. Because in my, in my experience over the years, trying to teach preaching, trying to explain things to people, it didn't get this. <laughs> Can I? Just arcing answers a lot of questions and is essential. What I'm going to do right now is in my judgment, what makes preaching powerful. I'm calling it the reality factor. So if you look at verses 12 and 13, there are at least five major realities behind five words. And arcing doesn't tell us how they work how they relate to each other in life. It doesn't. Well, here they are. Uh, In verse um, 13, there's the word hardness. There's the word sin. There's the word deceit or sin's deceitfulness. So now we have three major realities. What is hardness? What's it like? What does it feel like? 
do you know when it's happening? We're not talking about words anymore. We're not talking about logic. We're not talking about relationships. We're talking about your evening, your morning. What is this like? Or sin. What is sin? Words, words, words. What is it? What's the reality? What is deceit? What kind of deceit? What lies are being told? Do you know the reality you're dealing with? This is what brings you alive. This is what brings fellowship alive. This is what brings preaching alive, is reality. And then in verse 12, you've got the word evil. And you've got the word unbelief. And the logic of how these clauses fit together to not, does not explain how do, how do those five realities work to damn me? Because I'd like not to be damned. And I don't want my roommate or my wife or my daughter to be damned. And I gotta know what I'm up against. So what what you have to do is sink your way, pray your way into these realities, what you know about them from all the rest of Hebrews, what you know about them from the rest of the New Testament, and what you know about them from fighting with all your might that it not happened, and oh, what you learned that way about reality. I know it's dangerous to read experience into the Bible, but I tell you, if you don't have any experience with biblical realities, you'll never know the Bible, ever. It'll be words, words, words. Everybody will know the difference between those who are just dealing with words, dealing with logic, dealing with clauses, and those who know what you're talking about because they fought it face-to-face with the devil over and over again. They've dealt with all kinds of failure. They've dealt with triumphs. They know reality. That's what I'm after. So it's going to make your preaching live. It's going to make your people know, I'm coming back next week because I just met reality. He knew my heart. So we got these five realities. That's just, so here, here if, if, I, if I was in a class with you, we'd really work on this for hours. So I've got, I'm, in about the next five minutes, I'm going to give you my take on how this works. Okay, so realize this is like 50 years of experience Lots of thinking, like six sermons on this text, and uh, now you judge whether my understanding of these five realities and how they work to kill people is biblical. There's a catastrophe about to happen here, and uh, you are partly responsible to keep it from happening, according to verse 13, and here, I think, is how it happens. Let's start with sin. So I'm thinking through these five things, which is at the bottom, which causes everything. How do they all relate? Are they the same? Is re- so the way you think about arcing does affect how you think about words. Sin. Sin can be spoken of as subjectively, it's something I feel or do, or objectively, it's out there trying to draw me out to feel it or do it. And in either case, whether subjectively already operative in me or objectively pulling me to it, either way, sin is deceitful. It is, in its essence, a preference. I didn't mean to bring deceit in yet. That's going to be reality number two. Let's stay with with, uh, sin. Sin is, in its essence, not its totality, but its essence, you better get to the bottom of sin and think essence, a preference for anything over God. And we have to talk a couple hours about that. Check that out all over the Bible. At its essence, sin is preferring anything to God. If something is becoming more desirable, more preferable, you are sinning in essence. That's the bottom of every sin. Of course, there's adultery, there's lying, there's all kinds of uh, stealing, and, and every manner of outward expression, that's not the essence of what's going on that creates the greatest problem in the world, namely the wrath of God against us, not just people being hurt. So. The essence of sin is a preference for anything over God. Therefore, here we go, all sin is deceptive. 
It's luring us to believe a lie. So now we're into reality two, deceit, right? So we get, it, we get the word deceitful here. All sin is a lie, therefore nothing is more preferable than God. Or since nothing is more preferable than God, sin, which is a believing that something is more preferable than God, is always a lie. Because nothing is more desirable than God. Nothing. And if you are lured, if you are being lured into believing that it is, you are in sin. Third reality, when that deceit of sin insinuates itself, I tried to think of an analogy here. I just don't know enough about biology or icebergs or just, you, you help me here. When it insinuates itself into the human heart, one description of what happens as the deceit starts going into the heart is hardness happens. Lovers of C.S. Lewis got the ice just spreading. Right? Maybe that would work. But So as the deceit starts like tentacles going into the heart, lying to the heart. The heart begins to embrace the lie. What happens is hardness. What's that mean? What, what is that image supposed to do? I think it means not easily touched. Not easily penetrated by the truth and the beauty and the worth of Jesus. Just, just, Jesus presents himself, just, just ricochets off. And, 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 and the videos are so unbelievably compelling. And money is so compelling. Sex is so compelling. And power is so compelling. And wanting to be better than somebody is so compelling. It's just the compelling power of alternatives to God are a reflection of how hard your heart has become to seeing, feeling, being penetrated by the superior beauty and worth of Jesus. Reality number four, this hardening heart in verse 12 and how it's hardening is called an evil heart of unbelief. New categories. We had sin and deceit and hardness, and now we've got evil heart of unbelief. What do you, what do you, how does all that relate? My take is unbelief is another way of describing what happens as the truth and beauty and worth of Christ become less and less desirable less and less able to penetrate. It's called unbelief. It's just another way of, of describing, which, which has mega implications for how you pursue faith and preach faith. Because it means faith, in its essence, is not a mere assent to truth about Christ, but a heartfelt embrace of all the beauty and value of Jesus. Faith is, at its essence, the embrace, the receiving of all the beauty and all the truth, all the wonder of what it is to have God for you in Christ. It's a, a, a receiving, an embracing, a delighting, a being satisfied. You believe that about faith? Change everything you do. Everything you do in ministry. So reality number four is unbelief, which is a description of the process of what's going on in how sin and deceit and hardness occur. And the last reality is evil. It's called an evil heart of unbelief because it is, this, this heart is in the grip of a delusion that other things are more desirable than God. That's the delusion, and that, I would argue, is the essence of evil. That's the essence of evil. If you are in the grip 
right now of something holding on to your heart more precious, more beautiful, more satisfying than God, you have an evil heart. Or to be more careful, and we'll speak in just mere black and whites here, you are in this process on your way to destruction. And your roommate needs to step in and say something. <laughs> or the Bible might do it, but that's not my task. Tom Stellar did that. So my reason for digging into those five realities and trying to figure out how they work is because I don't think until you do that, you will know what your job is in Christian fellowship. You just won't know. Like, what am I supposed to do? I, I, I see it. I see it happening. It's right there in front of me. It's happening to her. It's happening to him. But if you, if you see the steps, if you see the pieces, if you see the dynamics, if you've, if you've done battle with this in your life for a few months or a few years or decades, you'll know some things to say. You'll know some things to do. Oh, yes, you will. Our job is, verse 13, exhort one another every day. You know why it says every day? Because you're being lied to every day. You are. Your flesh is lying to you. The world is lying to you. The devil is lying to you. Andy Nassali's message. You got, through, through the social media and all advertising, all TV programs, all movies, they all lie. All of them lie. I'd like to give examples right now, but they're all lying to you. Every day they're lying to you. So it's no accident that verse 13 says, exhort one another every day. So when I said, uh, you have a small group that meets every two weeks, that's fine. Just use email and be on the phone a lot. In other words, the, the pocket gatherings of, of weekly or biweekly are to establish relationships that get this thing going for every day. You think you don't need this every day. You don't know what you're up against. I'm so thankful for email and people that love my soul and have the courage to tell me things. This is your calling. This is your calling as a Christian. No matter what occupation or vocation you do, this is your calling. Christian friendships exist for this, namely to say things that keep each other believing. Small groups exist for this, to say things that keep each other believing. Christian counseling exists for this, to say things that keep each other believing. Church planting teams, oh, how crucial, in Afghanistan or wherever. Church planting teams exist for this. Keep each other believing. Christian marriage and parenting exists for this. Keep her believing. Yes, wives, keep him believing. Whatever you have to say whatever you have to do it is clear is it not what we need to say if the essence of deceit sin hardness unbelief falling away eternal destruction if if the if the essence of the deceit is god is less to be desired than blank what are you going to say He's better. He's better. Christ is better. His way is better. And a thousand experiential and biblical ways of showing that he's better. That's what you're going to say, right? And if that's right, and Hebrews 11 illustrates it with even the reproaches of Christ are better than the pleasures of Egypt. Chapter 11, verse 26. Even the reproaches of the Christ are greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. If, if that's the positive things we're going to say, 
the negative is also true. You're going to die if you don't turn around. You're going to say, the pleasures of Egypt are fleeting. Don't go there. You will perish in the Red Sea. If you go there, you'll die in the wilderness. If you go there, and we will warn them. I have a letter here. This is sent to me. I love to save letters. This is back when people wrote letters, 1992, handwritten by a young woman who was going here in the 80s. And she was living in fornication, and her conscience was bothering her. And uh, she came to see me. We drew that out. And after a little while, I said to her, you know, don't you, that if you continue in this, you'll go to hell. Here's what she wrote seven years later. 1985, this was written in 92, 1985. I wonder whether you remember a very much younger me sitting in your office and telling you I was afraid God would have to use a car accident or some other awful event to get my attention. You pointed out that the consequences of my deliberate choice to continue sinning would be nothing short of hell itself. No one had ever before told me I was headed for hell. Missionary kid that I was saved, in quotes, at age six. It was a turning point in my life. And I have wanted to thank you and tell you that ever since. I assured mom that a warning such as that in 1985 conversation made me feel the more loved after I heard what you really think of it in listening to your message. That you cared enough to tell me a stranger at the time means more than ever with the echo in my ears. Your compassion came through to me. You say he's better, and you say, if you don't turn and fight this, you're going to perish. You say that to your roommate. You say it to your child. Maybe one more story and a closing word. Seeing Tom sitting back there, I love Tom Steller. A few people have strengthened my hand in the Lord more than Tom for 37 years, longer actually. Um, and we've done a lot of things together. You'll remember this one, Tom. There's a woman in the 80s again who was struggling with such terrible depression, and she was suicidal, scary so. We were young, we didn't know much, but we made her promise us, we were in this together, we made her promise us, you will not hurt yourself without calling us. Okay, you promise? I promise, All right? So in, late one night, I get a call, uh, Tom, no, I say, look, you must promise me, promise me right now, I'm gonna call the police, promise me that you'll meet us at the church within 15 minutes. We both live close by, so did she to church, she did. The building is gone now, but I can picture where we sat in the 1914 building. And we sat with her, how long, Tom? Two, three hours. The darkness in that room, spiritually, was awful. You could just see, it was like a huge, heavy, wet, dark blanket. Everything about her was oppressed. And we exhorted her and gave promises to her and prayed with her and sat in silence with her. And God lifted that darkness. You could see it lift. That woman is in this church ministering today. And I believe, Tom, we saved her. We did. God Almighty used us with words and prayer to save her, both from physical and probably spiritual destruction. 
leave you with one picture of what you're called to do. In 1 Samuel 23, David's life is in the balance. The people of the town of Keilah have betrayed him, and the uh, prophet tells him they're going to betray you, so he s escapes and leaves Keilah. At the end of the chapter, the Ziphites treacherously tell Saul quietly where David is, and Saul comes after him. David finds out he escapes by the skin of his teeth. I've tried to imagine the pressure of doing ministry like that. Pressure, stress, tension, discouragement. And you want to say, is it worth it to be the Lord's anointed? And you will say that. Is it worth it to be a Christian? Is it worth it to be a pastor? How are you going to survive in those moments? How did David survive? Well, I think the chapter is arranged this way. Between the betrayal and the treachery, right in the middle here is verse 16. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. got a friend like that be that for each other be that for each other we can't survive without God's mercy horizontally mediated to us so exhort one another every day as long as it is called today lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Serious. It's a glorious calling. Let's pray. So, Father in heaven, in this room right now, I know that there are folks who feel like their heart is becoming hard and untouchable by your supreme and superior beauty and worth. And I, I just plead for them right now that they would wake up, he's better, he's better. And to go the other way holds no future, only tragedy. So put these folks into sweet communion with each other, deep and eternal, with overflowing words of rescue, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.